Dangerous, giving the young guy the mic. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> uh, so I'll just open in prayer, and then we'll go into, I'll just introduce myself, who I am, and dive into things. So, yeah, Jesus, we just thank you, God, for today. Thank you, Lord, that we get, get the privilege of knowing you, that we get to walk every day with you in intimacy, in wholeness, and in purpose, and in fullness, God. So I just thank you, God, for the gift of today and just the journey we get to be on with you. So we pray all these things in your name. Amen. So you want to go ahead and throw up that intro slide, and I'll just talk a little bit about who I am and what I do, where I came from. <laughs> um, so most of you know me, but for those of you that don't, um, I grew up in Grace Church. Um, I think we came here maybe when I was like, I don't know, less than, less than eight or nine. Um, got saved here, like after church one day, my mom led me to the Lord, like on our bathroom floor, and, or uh, it was laundry room floor, and I, was, and I was crying, and it was really real, and then my sister was making fun of me, and I, then I got immediately like got mad at my sister, and I was like, why, I'm, this is real, like I'm having a moment with God, and so... That was after one day coming here, um, and so growing up here, I went to UW for college, um, wanted to be an NFL kicker for most of my life growing up, uh, it didn't happen, but got pretty close in some ways, it was a blast, um, then did uh, engineering at UW-Madison, um, just finished that last December, that was a really fun journey, focused on med devices. Um, and then during college, I really got impacted by the Lord to do missions. Um, and so a lot of college, I had like a lot of coming to. God set me free from a lot of mindsets and became like my closest friend. <laughs> and it's really that fellowship with God that changed my life. Like there's so many moments where I just like, I just knew God was there. And I was in this place of brokenness freshman year and God just met me in that place. And all of a sudden I... I like, had this desire, like, man, I just want to worship. I just want to pray. I just want to, like, spend time with you, God, because I know you're good, and I know you're there, and you know you're with me. And so went on this adventurous journey, went to Uruguay for six weeks in 2015, came back. I was like, all right, not supposed to be a missionary. Like, did the thing. <laughs> came back, I went and shared the gospel, and felt really, like, exhausted, burnt out. I was like, all right, like, I don't think this is for me. Like, <laughs> I went and did the thing, and, and I was being obedient, but now I don't feel like I'm supposed to do that anymore. Like, it's, it should be sustainable. And um, got back from that trip, got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then all of a sudden, like, I would pray in tongues for, like, the next month. Like, like any, any time I would pray in tongues, I would just get hit by the presence of God, and I would just weep. And I would be at work in this, like, little dinky engineering hall job, and I would just like, oh man, I should, I should just be, I should just pray in tongues for a little bit. And then all of a sudden I would do that and I would just begin to weep in the workplace. And I'm like, oh no, like I'm, I'm around people like this is, this is not good. Like I'm, this is embarrassing. Like someone comes in, like I, this is, I'm not working. Like I'm having a moment with God now. Like they're paying me for this. Like I, I probably, this is, I don't know, I probably shouldn't be doing this. And so that lasted for like a month or two, but that was really real and impacted my life a lot. And so from that place, like, I was digesting all these books on missions and reading, all, and just like reading through the Bible that year, and like God really touched my heart. And so I knew at some point um, I'm supposed to do this, and then God confirmed a bunch of stuff, and now this is what I want to do with my life. So a lot more details in there, but that's kind of the flyby. Um, so now I work for a group called Overland Missions. Um, they focus on rural people groups across the world or forgotten peoples. Um, be it like those that live in tents and mud huts, like in sub-Saharan Africa, or in the Middle East. Um, so I spend half my years like split between the Middle East and then, um, so I own like two thirds, two thirds Middle East. And then I'm running these short-term trips in uh, Zambia. And so in uh, in Zambia, like we, if you scroll down a little bit, we live in tents and everything. We we uh, like drive into these military vehicles and we show up in a in a place. And we just bring the kingdom of God there, going house to house, running revival meetings, running like any sort of school meetings, anything of that nature. But that's like the style of ministry we do. And then if you scroll up to the Middle East, uh, just go up to the top picture. Yeah. And so in the Middle East, it looks different. It's most 
in most places it's illegal to share the gospel. So if you go and like have a big night meeting <laughs> or just like go start sharing on the streets, likely you'll get kicked out of the country and then you can't do ministry there. So it has to look a little different. And so you do ministry through relationship and you believe God for kind of radical things. And you, you, you in, in those contexts, you press in with the gospel. In those contexts, you press in with the Holy Spirit and the power of God. And so, yeah. That's the, the overview. Um, my family is on the picture to the right, if you scroll a little bit. And that's all of us. And then I just got engaged. And so that was, yeah. <laughs> so pretty exciting, crazy phase of life. We didn't really think I was going to be engaged right now, but I am. And it's amazing. And she works for uh, another ministry right now, but she's going to join with Overland, and we're going to continue on towards the Middle East. She has a huge heart for thereafter. Um, so, uh, just a little br brief overview of Overland, just to kind of let everyone know it's what we do. Um, what we focus on is a really kind of like sustainable cycle. Uh, we go into places and we have the spearhead with the gospel. So we're going in, like doing mass evangelism, going to everyone and everyone that we can, and seeing people touched by God, seeing people come to Christ, seeing people healed, set free, all, all of the things. And, but we're seeing people come to know God. And then from that place, um, we do discipleship. So that's like the secular management ship. That's our long-term people on the ground. So we have these short-term trips. They lead in with gospel. Then we have long-term people on the ground. They disciple people. And then they're empowering indigenous leaders. And then there's like sustainability projects to help like equip people with even like their jobs or equip people in other leadership positions. And then the model is built so that it like works ourselves out of a job. So like our vision going into a new area or a region is like, okay, how can we empower the people here? How can we empower anyone in these circumstances to like work ourselves out of the community? I think a lot of places have struggled with um, like white, like Westerners coming in and like building themselves into this place of like I'm, like, 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 I'm the savior of this area. And so we try and deconstruct that and really make it practical. Like, no, it's just all about Jesus and it's all about empowering the people. Yeah. So I just wanted to, before I dive into the main, main message, I just wanted to share a few testimonies from the year um, and then dive into some content. So the first set of pictures is that top one there. Um, so we rolled up to this. It was our first expedition in Zambia this year. I spent two months in Oman and then two months in, in Zambia and then two months in Jordan, and that was the whole year. Um, but during this center month in Zambia, this guy riding the bike actually hadn't walked in a year and a half. And so uh, there is a, a witch in the village, like witchcraft, super real in this part of Africa and a lot of places in the world. But there is like his uncle was a witch. And so his uncle had put a spell on him. And for a year and a half, like he was bedridden. And for a year and a half, he didn't didn't get out of bed, like, in, in our, like, unless, like, by assistance. And so our team came upon him, and they, they prayed with him. And then he got set free from a bunch of demons that had, like, come into him or come over him. And then he was able to walk afterwards. And then he was even riding his bike that he hadn't ridden in, like, a year and a half. And then his whole family was just so open to the gospel. His whole, the, and, like, we saw, like, that was a community where witchcraft was really present. And so we lot of, saw a lot of demonic stuff. But, like, in that place, like, we just, you just put, like, a tent peg in and, like, Jesus is a light and Jesus is all-powerful. And, then like, okay, things are real like that and people are affected by this, like, the spirit realm. Like, demons are, are real, but it, it's not necessarily a thing where we need to be fearful because God ha is the ultimate authority and you just come in in simple authority and demons are like, wow, Jesus. Like, <laughs> sometimes it takes, like, endurance and sitting with someone. Like, I one, uh, one time I sat with this person who was, like actually rolling and rolling and shaking on the ground. And I just sat with them for probably about 45 minutes, just praying with them, just, just, like, just like being like, no, you're like, you are free. And like, like declaring freedom over them and just continuing just to like pray in tongues over them. It was just like this journey. And eventually after 45 minutes, like this person got set free. And it's just like that, that p simple place of love. Like you don't need to yell. You don't need to like, you don't have more authority in, in God when you yell. Like it's actually... <laughs> It's actually just the same, like, no, like, wow, like, we've been given authority, not by vocal authority. But so we, I just sat with them, and then they're free. And then that person, like, we cut off some charms from them, and they received Jesus. And so, like, that's just the simple, like, purity we walk in. We're just like, we're, we're going to bring Jesus. We're going to walk in 
the power of God. We're going to walk in, like, delivering people, however that looks, but we're going to come and bring God and, and see these people empowered from their circumstances. And so that's what a lot of Zambia looks like often. It's a very open nation. Overland's been there for, like, 20 years. And um, just like a lot of open doors, like we have 85 more chiefdoms that's just like, we want your people to come, <laughs> like, like come and bring like, what you're bringing to these other places. We want, we want your God. Um, so that's Zambia. Then um, in J Jordan, this is that photo. Um, we're working with some rural peoples called the Bedouin people or the Turkmen, um, gypsy people. I don't know if you've seen gypsies on movies. They're kind of like more overtly spiritual often. And um, the women typically prostitute. And the, the men will sell, like, metal scraps and different things. Um, but, like, they're, it's so interesting because they're, like, this is a Kia Motors, like, this place off to the left. <laughs> and then there's just some tents, like, just, just scattered across the city. It's like if you, like, the next lot over, there was just some tents got posted up in the city, and there is then people living in them. And so in Jordan, that's really common. Um, there's a lot of different layers of society, and not everyone lives in, in buildings and it's just like I don't know they don't like necessarily mix and don't mess with each other but they just live in peace together but this is a community where we began working with and we've seen a lot of open doors um, similar sort of stuff um, some people in this community are really oppressed with with demons and they've made partnerships that they don't really know but this guy we met um, was sharing like this this spirit like to them they know it's a spirit but it's just like they don't know it's bad or good they don't have no any like demographic here it's a, they're Muslim and they have like this weird spiritual mix. And so a little bit different, but Jordan's 95% Muslim. But here um, they're like, well, I have this spirit. And he keeps telling me that I should throw myself off this cliff and kill myself. And I should kill my wife. And so we're like, all right. And so we like talk with this guy. We're working with him. And, and we're there. We just like roll up to their tents and just like begin relationship with them. And they, they invite us in for tea. And we're having tea with them. And just like communing with them, having fellowship. And then things come up and opportunities come up. The gospel comes up and you just, you just build relationship in those ways. But this guy ends up wanting freedom. And so we're like, hey, like if you, <laughs> if you want freedom from this thing, like you're going to need to receive Jesus. Like you, you have to have something to fill that void or else it's dangerous because like then the enemy just has free reign. And so we ended up getting to lead that man to, to Christ. And then like two weeks later, we came back and he was like a new man. Like, all of a sudden, he was, like, clean. He was, like, fine. He was, like, more about his wits. And we were praying with his friend for his, his friend had shoulder pain from this weird encounter that he had with an evil spirit. And we're praying with him. And he's, like, this baby Christian, doesn't know anything. And he, like, has his, and we ask him to pray with us. And because it's just, like, you, you teach people how to pray for people right away. And you teach people, like, no, like, you now have the Holy Spirit. Like, you didn't, like we are not different than you. Like, we're just believers. Like, we, we may be have done this before, but, like, now you have the Holy Spirit. Like, you can do the same thing. <laughs> and so he's, like, praying, and he doesn't know how to pray, really, but he's just, like, Allah Akbar, like, which is, like, God is the greatest, but, like, that's all he knows how to pray, and God's shoulder ends up getting healed. <laughs> and so it's just, like, this simple thing. Like, it, it, it's in the, the, in the pureness of the heart. You step out in faith, and you empower people, and in that place, like, eventually there's, like, you, people learn how to pray. People learn how to, like, walk through different things, but, like, they, they see immediately, like, okay, God is real. God cares about me. God is powerful. He is more powerful than, than sickness. He is more powerful than demons. He is more powerful than anything. And you just get to see that again and again and again and teach people that. Okay, so let's, let's go to the one that's an overview of the message, and then we'll go from there. Um, but pretty much, I wanted to just walk through... And really share with you guys, like, these are, oh, yeah, this is a good, this is a good slide, but not, not the one I was saying. But, uh, so this is overall um, expedition stats this year in Zambia alone. Oh, no, all, this is all expeditions. So Zambia, Cambodia, Zanzibar, Philippines. Um, we brought the gospel as, like, an expeditions department um, to about, like, 1,300 people. Um, we got to see, like, 3,400 people come to Christ. Um, 700 healings and, like, about 225 deliverances. And so... Really awesome year. The expeditions I was upon, like we got to see probably 750 of those salvations, and it's just awesome. These are more testimonies. I don't have super amount of time for that, but it's just like I, 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 the, there's just testimony after testimony of God's faithfulness, of God's power, of God's goodness, of God's pursuit of people, of just the simpleness of like, all right, like <laughs> this is Jesus. This is the this is the purity within Him. Here is forgiveness of your sins. 
And you just get to see like transformation after transformation and God validating it just again and again by like just power and signs and wonders. And so these are more testimonies, but I'm not going to go into that right now. We'll see if I have time at the end. But the overall um, scaffolding of like the, just the message I want to dive into is called, um, yeah, so that was testimonies fly by the year. Then two, I just want to talk about the purpose of life. Um, then three, talk about sonship, grace, and identity. And then uh, four, I just wanted to make some additions to the baptism of the Spirit and spiritual gifts that Dale Crawl shared last week and just some stuff that I was like, all right, like, that was awesome. I just wanted to, like, add even more onto it and just, like, like validate it again because I think it's important and I think it's valuable and I've just seen the evidence. Um, um, to Even, like, on the fourth, like, additions to the baptism of the Spirit and spiritual gifts, there was this um, Florida, Florida girl that came on an expedition in Zambia um, that, like, was afraid to pray for our food. <laughs> and, and she was like, we asked her to pray for our meal one night. We're out in the bush. Like, it's a new context. Like, understandably, it could be a little scary. Like, new people. Like, we're out in the middle of nowhere. But she's afraid to pray for our meal. But then she does it. But then that night, we have a teaching on the Holy Spirit and baptism of the Spirit. And she ends up, like, falling to the ground, like, erupting in tongues, like, crazy, like, like experience with God. The next day, we ask her to preach at the night meeting. And she's like, yeah, like, <laughs> I'm in, like, like, let me, let me, I'll preach, and we're like, just like night and day, and then like the next day, she got healed of asthma, and then the next day, her herniated disc got healed, and so we were like, <laughs> she was like, when I go home, like, I'm gonna go run a marathon or something, and like, I'll invite all you guys, like, my life went from here to here, like, and she like, was just so ready to go share Jesus with people, and so that's really like a cool testimony of like, people that even come to, come on trips with us, like, we want to like, show them who they are, we want to show them who God is, we want to, like equip and teach, empower them and be like, no, like this is the kingdom of God. This is the reality of life. And this is what like, God has for you. Like God is real. God loves you. And it's, it's simple. It's not, it's not this complex, like, I don't know, theology degree. Like theology is awesome and important, but if your theology doesn't move you to action, like something's amiss. If your theology just, this results in self-knowledge and like, like st stableness, and your relationship with God doesn't lead to action. Like something is out of order. Not, not in condemnation, but it's just like in this place of like, all right, like our relationship with God should be so inspiring and our intimacy with God should be so good that it should lead us to things. It should, it should, it should lead us to this place of like, wow, I can't help but share Jesus with this person. So first, um, I just wanted to kind of press into the, the purpose of life and the meaning of those things. And so I think I wanted to ask this question. You can take this down. Um, but, like, how many people know their great-great-grandparents? Like, can I get a raise of hand? Like, who knows their great-great-grandparents? Okay, like a few. And so that's, like, just a few people in the room. And that most of them probably lived, um, like, l they died probably 50 years ago. But, like, th reflecting on it, like, most of us don't know the life of our great-grandparents. And that's just, like, like, I think three or four generations removed from us. And so, like, I, like myself, I don't know my great-grandparents really even. I think I, well, there's a, like, family tree picture about it. But I, I don't personally remember their name, necessarily what they did, or, like, what, what happened in their life. And, and I'm, I'm here because of them. But, like, besides that, like, I don't, I don't know anything. What, what was the fruit of their life? Like, what's, there's barely, to me, there's barely a memory of their life. And like, so what, what is left in their life? What was, what is the remaining things from their life? And I, and I began to ask myself this question a lot during college of what, what is the purpose of life? And what is life so quick? Like we're here and then we're gone and then eternity, like eternity in size of a finite matter, like a finite number of years is still like infinite. <laughs> like it doesn't end. And that would cripple me when I was younger. And so I like really thought this was serious. And I would be like, man, I can't waste my life. I can't, I can't just live these years idle because then it's gone. And then, then all of a sudden eternity is here. And so like, what is life really about if we have this purposeful time here? What is life really like supposed to be about? I used to walk through even um, like some graveyards and I would look up people's names. And I'd be like, what can I find? Like, what can I find about their life? Like, <laughs> what, did, what, was, what was true of their life? And it, most of the time you can't find anything unless like, oh, like here's... Sally, whatever, like she had a company and like that's the only thing that remained. But it's really like, it's just this heavy setting of like this verse, um, 
In 1 Corinthians 3.15, it's like, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. It's 1 Corinthians 3.15. But that reality of, like, what we build with and what we put into life, only what we, like, invest in the kingdom, and only what we invest in eternity, and only what we invest even in, in people, like, is what will last. Everything else will be burned up, and we'll still make it to heaven, but it's like everything else will be, there'll be nothing we have brought with us. And I think heaven, like heaven's currency is people. Like you get to bring as many people as you want to heaven with you, and that's eternal. Everything else, like if I got a fancy car, like sweet, it'd be good for a few years, but then like that's not eternal. <laughs> and, if, and if I had an amazing house, if I did all, if I was super successful and really famous, like, and I became an NFL kicker. Like, that would be awesome. Everyone would know my name. But in an eternity, like, what did that matter? And so, in, it just, like, it hits me again and again. Like, there's John 17, 3. It's like, now this is eternal life, that they may know you and Christ Jesus, whom you have sent. Like, that's, that's really, like, the, the essence of, like, what is the purpose of life? Like, to know God. <laughs> Like, in the garden, we, we lost, like, through Adam, like, we were born spiritually dead. Adam lost relationship with God. That's always what God wanted. And through Jesus, now he's restored that. And that's the invitation to us back into the relationship with God. That's why Jesus came. That's why, like, like God's moving and active. Like, he wants to know people. He wants restored relationship. He wants to be in fellowship with his people. He wants to to be amidst his people. And that's like, you even see that with Israel, like they were unfaithful, <laughs> but God loved them and pursued them. And so this is, this is what I really want to get at. It's like pur- the purpose of life is to love God and love people. The purpose of life is to like completely submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus and be like, God, like I love you. You gave everything for me. Like I'm in like <laughs> whatever, whatever you want of my life, like you're worth it. You went bankrupt to receive me back, like, through the life of Jesus, like, that's incredible. Now I get to have life with you and not eternity in hell, not eternal separation from you. Like, that's amazing. And, like, this is what the ancients wished for. Like, this fellowship, this communion with God, this is what people of all generations past, like, longed for the day when, like, we would be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Like, God used to dwell in a physical temple, but like now he's purified us, made us clean, called us righteous, and we are now like the temple of the Holy Spirit. Like that's not a light thing. Like that's a serious thing. And, and we get to, to be carriers of his presence. We get to be carriers of him. And it's beautiful. And so like I just like so many times in my life, God's brought me back to the moment of like, like salvation and just been like, yeah, Joey, but like there's all this stuff, but like, you know me. There's all these things going on. There's all these hardships, but like, you know me. <laughs> and I, it would just ruin me. And there are times where I would be, I would have done something really stupid and God would bring back the verse of like, yeah, Joey, but like, though you're condemning yourself, that like, even while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. So like, how much more even now? Like, you're born again, you're new, you're made clean, like, still love you. <laughs> and, and there's, there's a way you can go about, you can reject the Lord if, if you want to, but like, that's like, God gave us grace, and it's always grace, and there's always going to be this grace in pursuit of God of like, you're my child, like I love you, and I want to have communion with you. I don't, don't hide yourself from me. And I think some people get fearful um, about like, struggling with intimacy with God and doubting, but like, all of those things are actually invitations closer to God. Like when you see Thomas doubted, like it was an invitation where Jesus actually invited him closer. He was like, Thomas, touch, like touch my hands, put your hand in my side, like feel these things. Like in, in our own wrestlings, in our own struggles, like all of those things are invitations closer to God. And God's never looking at it as being like con- condemnation of like, oh, you're thinking this thing, like you're, you're having this struggle, like get away from me. <laughs> like I, I hate you. Like, I think sometimes we view God as this wrathful, like, God is just. God is wrath. Like, he has those qualities. But, like, God is also a father. God is also kind. He's merciful. 
And I always think of like the example of if, if my kids did something wrong and I immediately blew up and were like, that's it, you're out of family. <laughs> I think that's sometimes how we view God of like, wow, like I've, I've messed up. Like God must hate me. Like that's it. Like he's going to kick me out. <laughs> but like, oh, we don't even do that in the earth. And God's a perfect father. God's a good God. He is like the definition of goodness. <laughs> There's a reason, like, Jesus cried out, like, Abba, Father, like, Daddy, God. Like, it's not this. Like, when, you're, when you come into fellowship with God, you're restored to God, it is that relationship of, like, wow, like, God loves me, and he's in this with me, and he's not going to just push me away. And so I just wanted to rapid fire some verses on grace, because I think that's something that's really important and really impactful in my walk, and I think it's really what sustains me in a lot of ways. Um, so... Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. So just revealing that verse that I said before. Then um, in Psalms 1 and 3, it said, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Then Romans 11, 5, 6, So too at the present time there is a current, there is a remnant chosen by grace, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. And so I love that first because it's just like, okay, like at the present time, still a remnant of people, still these people that like God is with, God is in his people, God is, is fellowshipping with man and chosen by grace, the grace of God, a free gift given through Jesus. And, but if it is not by that grace and, no longer on the, and it, it is no longer on the basis of works, like that's this separation of like this works-based thing, this works-based thing of like we're, we're evaluating our own selves and thinking like, works, like I need to do these things, then God will be pleased with me. It's like, no, God was unpleased with man because they sinned, and so he sent Jesus, and now he's pleased with man. Satisfied, like we're born again, not anything of what we ever could do, but because of the grace of God. And otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Like, I love that part because it's just like, grace isn't grace if we earn it. <laughs> Like, it, it, it just, it's not, it does not work in the definitions of the English language. <laughs> and, like, if, if, if you are given something that you didn't deserve, you can't do anything to, like, try and earn it back. Like, <laughs> God didn't give it to you because you, you, you did something great. Like, you did it because he loved you, and he wanted to know you, and he wanted to, like, fellowship with you. And, and just another verse, then, on that same one. Like, the Galatians, they went through this narrative where, this guy came in after Paul, his name was Lysidius, and he preached Christ plus circumcision. And so all of Galatians is pretty much in response to like, no, 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 like it's not Jesus and circumcision, then you're saved. It's like, no, it's like just Jesus. <laughs> and um, so in Galatians 3, it says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your very eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to obtain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing? Saw miracles among because you observed the law or because of what you have heard? And so going back to then chapter before, it says, We who are Jews by birth and not Gentiles Gentile sinners, know that a man is not justified, not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ, Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. And so there's a lot of other verses on this, but this is the narrative again and again of God, God's grace. Like, it's never about, like, yes, we need to be obedient and respond in, in this act, and there's, there is a response on our end. But we could never earn God's love. We could never earn God's affection. We could never earn God's attention. <laughs> like, God, God looks at us, and he, he's, it's normally like there's an impedance from our side of like trying to receive stuff from him. He's normally seeking after us, and normally chasing after us. But there's typically this mindset of like, oh, I'm shameful. Like, oh, like I don't, I'm not good enough. Like, I don't measure up. Like, like that was true. <laughs> and that's why God came. And, and sent his son and, and gave Jesus so that you could be enough. And that, like, God could look at you and declare, like, you're worthy. Like, now that we're born again, like, we're actually worthy 
of, of the cross and worthy of God because God has made us righteous. God has made us holy. He has made us blameless. Like all of these different things. And so just to like talk to even our new identity, like we've been crucified with Christ. We've died with Christ. Uh, we've been buried with Christ. And then we were made alive with Christ. Um, we were raised with Christ. And we were seated with Christ. Like there, there is a passage to each of those, those points. But like all of those are now realities for us as Christians. And it's our identity. And it's how God looks at us. He doesn't look at us as like, oh, my shameful, like, frustrating child. Like, and just you again. Like, seriously. He's like, no, like, I put my spirit in you. Like, I made you a temple of God. You're like, my, like, like, the deity of God dwells within us, transformed the, like, the truest form we are as a spirit, spirit like, man, and, and, and made us alive. And now we can have a relationship with God, which is the greatest miracle of all. Like, seeing people, seeing people healed and seeing people delivered, like, is awesome. Like, it's, it's I mean, it's, it's like, literally, King, like, King Jesus showing up and, 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 and a circumstance changing. But, like, all of that stuff's not eternal. Like, relationship with Jesus is. Salvation is eternal. And the gifts are awesome, and we need to, like, press into the gifts. But, like, if, if they aren't leading us to a place of encounter with God and this eternal life of knowing God, like, that's the crux of all of this, of just, like, getting to have a relationship with the King of Kings, getting to have communion and relationship, and from that place just being led in, in power. Because it doesn't have to look like being a missionary. It doesn't have to look like anything necessarily, like being a pastor. Like, those are good things. <laughs> and, and God is calling people to those things. But if we fellowship with God, he will lead us on the place that he has for us. Like, be it in the business world or be it as a parent. Like, all of those are vocations of the kingdom. <laughs> like, you can be a man of God, a woman of God in a lot of different ways. And God is very pleased with that. And... Um, so even just one more verse is Hebrews 10, 11 through 12, 14. It says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when his, this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect those who are, are being made holy. So by one sacrifice, Jesus made perfect, made blameless, all that are now being made holy, which that end part is a little interesting of like, okay, made perfect, but then like being made holy. And, but like there's this dichotomy of like, we, we are spirit, soul, and body. And so when we're saved, like our spirit's born again, made righteous, all these things, but then we still go through sanctification. Like we still have, <laughs> like we have to have the renewing of our mind. We have to go through working out, like maybe we have things going on that just old mindsets that we need to walk through. That stuff's also real. And so you have this this dichotomy in this verse of like made perfect forever and then being made holy. Like both reality, both sanctification is a process and being born again, like being declared righteous and blameless before the Lord, also reality. And um, like when you enter that reality with God, like there is no lack in the sense of in, in the kingdom. Like you have been given all things for life and godliness. And that's like a perspective that we get to walk throughout the world that like, wow, God knows my life. God knows me. He takes care of the sparrows of the air and like he knows my, what I'm going through. Like he, he walks with me. He talks to me. Like he tells me that I'm like his own, like that song. Like that is the reality. And we, we have all things that God is like, if God's going to cost us something, he's also going to like make a way. He's also going to provide for it. He's also going to like, work supernaturally to make those things happen. If he's speaking and leading into you in a way, like God just doesn't leave us. He's not just like, all right, like do the thing. <laughs> like he's, he's with us. Like he's, 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 he's alive and real. And so just to close, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about just a few additions to the baptism of the Spirit. This will be quick. And then just about spiritual gifts too. Um, and just like some of my journey, I used to think that healing and prophecy and all these things were, were like, oh, like God's going to come up from the clouds and I'm going to see like, thus saith the Lord and it will be clear and I will have an open vision and, and then like, like all of these people will start getting healed and 
that can happen. I hear testimonies of people ha that happening to people. I'm like, okay, wow, like, awesome. <laughs> but not my journey. Like, I went on this journey of, like, one time I gave a prophetic word to this guy at a coffee shop. I was like, this is dangerous. Like, I could, it's me and this guy. Like, God, like, would you give me something? And this is, like, one of my first times. Like, God, I really want to minister to this guy, but I have no idea. And so I got this weird image of a fruit, and, that, like, as you bit into it, it was rotten. And I was so scared. <laughs> I, but I was like, I asked for this. Like, dang it. Like, I'm, I'm, supposed to, I'm supposed to now, like, I wanted to minister to this guy, but now God gave me this thing. I'm really confused on what it means. Like, but now I need to take a step of faith. And so it's just like this really scary journey. And I was really unsure the whole time. But I ended up sharing this thing with that guy. And he's like, man. And I, and I ended up, like, receiving revelation on it. And I, like, as I'm sharing it, it makes more sense. But it, like, and this guy's like, you know what, like, my crazy Christian friend, like, told me the same thing a few weeks ago, and I'm like, oh, wow, like, I, I, so all of a sudden, like, I, and I had no idea necessarily what I was doing, but I was just, like, trying to step out, <laughs> and I was on this journey, journey with the Lord, and so I would pray for other people, and, and different things, and prayed for my friend that was my Bible study leader, and you just kind of be faithful in different moments, and, like, I don't know, like, you just take steps, I wasn't certain, certain what was going to happen, but I was like, I know this is true in the Bible, and I know that I've seen it before, and I'm just going to, like, take a step. And this is uncomfortable and weird, but I think there's grace for that. <laughs> and so I prayed for him, and he ends up, like, getting healed of, like, this cough and sinus thing. And he's like, man, I feel, like, weird. Like, it's crazy. Like, what's going on? I was like, yeah, like, it's just the same stuff in the Bible. So, like, that was the beginning of my journey. Like, that was probably last, that was last fall, yeah, <laughs> of, like, stepping out in, into some of those things in the States, like, I think it's really scary. Like, you see these testimonies overseas, like, oh, God's moving overseas, but, like, God's also the same here. And I think it, it's fearful, like, coming into our own familiar context. It's fearful sometimes being weird, but, like, <laughs> like if you house it in a way that's not weird, it becomes really meaningful to people and really practical. Like, I can come up to see someone and be like, hey, like, this is something I feel like God's saying, and not being like, hey, this is your life for the next 30 years. Like, <laughs> that can happen. But if you're going to tell someone, like, thus saith the Lord, this is about, like, you better be certain. <laughs> and, but, like, the prophetic is also this place of, like, it's like an open grounds for God to give you revelation on someone's life and, and to present that to them. And then for, like, God to show up in a miraculous way of, like, they're like, wow, like, how did you know that? You're like, well, like, that's what I felt like God was showing me. And then you see these circumstances again and again. Or God's, it's just a simple act, the simple act of like, hey, this is what I, like, this is a, the word that I feel like I'm getting from the God. This is a, like an image I'm getting from God, all those different things. And just, that's just some practical, I like to demystify the supernatural as much as I can because it's just normal. <laughs> like, it's not meant to be this weird, like, ethereal, complex, like, weird stuff. Like, it's just, all right, like, I'm in relationship with God. This is what I'm feeling, and, and this is what I'm sensing. I'm, I'm going to step out and learn how to, like, operate in those things. And I think... It, as you grow in relationship with God, you learn how to filter through those things. And if you know the word, like, you need to know the word because you can test what you're seeing. You can test what you're hearing. And if you know God and know the nature of God, and you're attached to your Bible and not untethered from it, it becomes very easy to be like, wow, that, that's something God would say, or that's something God would want to do. Like, God does love in that way, and he's not necessarily being crazy and weird. And so, to close, um, I got five minutes. Um, <laughs> um, so, teaching this whole summer, I got to teach a lot on the baptism of the Spirit, and I saw a lot of fruit in, it, in people's lives, and, and, I, and I like to also try and demystify that as much as I can, because that's, it's a controversy in the church, and it's weird often, and it's like, then people speak in tongues at different points, like, what is that all about? And it's confusing often. But I, it's, I think it's never meant to be this confusing thing or never meant to be this, like, like other, like, weird threshold, but it's just like a gift from God. And so, like, Dale explained this last week, but just to affirm everyone, like, like the baptism of the Spirit is not, like, when you receive the Holy Spirit. Like, you have Holy Spirit when you become a believer. Like, you are a temple of God. Like, you are, like, a child of God. Your name is written in the book of life. Like, when you receive Jesus, like, that is reality. And, like, Romans... 8, 9 talks about, like, for those that have received Jesus, they have the Spirit of God, or, like, that's really paraphrased. But it's basically, like, okay, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. If you have Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. Like, there's a bunch of verses that confirm that. So if everyone, anyone tries to teach you, like, 
you don't have Holy Spirit or you're not saved until you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, like, that's weird. And there's a lot of verses to tell them that's not right and that's weird. <laughs> and, but what um, the baptism of the Spirit is, is it's like, it, come, it is this empowerment of God for ministry. And you see that in, in Acts 1. Um, just to go to there quick. At this point, the, uh, the believers that already have um, received the Holy Spirit, um, but this is, the empower, this is like Jesus foretelling them of what's to come. Because in John 20, which is just before this, the page, like, Jesus comes, breathes on his disciples, and it says, receive the Holy Spirit. And, and I've always thought that was weird. Like, why did he breathe on his disciples? Like, is he, did he have, like, really good breath that day? Was, was it now, like, this weird, like, why, why, why does the Bible say that he breathed on his disciples? I feel like that shouldn't matter. But then I, I was either reading or listening to a teaching, and, like, that's the only other time in Scripture where God breathed life into man. Like, in, in the beginning... God breathed life into Adam. But then in this moment again, like Jesus has already died and rose again, he breathes on his disciples and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he breathes on them. And that is like the only other instance like where God breathes life into man. And like in this moment, there is life breathed into the disciples. And so then like following that, like just in the next chapter in Acts, um, Jesus says, it is not for you to know the times or dates, but the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so this is, this is the context that, that Jesus immediately sets up for what he declares as, like, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And he said, like, the, immediately defines it, he says, when the, like, the Holy Spirit comes on me, you will receive power, and you will be my witness. And so immediately Jesus gives this command and connection of like, okay, like, what's it for? Like, <laughs> like, you, like you already, like, you just told them to receive Holy Spirit. Now he's saying, like, the Holy Spirit will come on them, and, like, then they will be his witness. And so they're waiting for this experience. And um, I think it's just really beautiful when housed in even really simple terms, like Holy Spirit in you, for you, and Holy Spirit on you for others. And when, like, kind of demystified and kind of, like, made, like, there are a lot of crazy things that can happen during the baptism of the Spirit. Like, it's awesome. And it's God. But, like, I think that just simple, like, phrase of, like, Holy Spirit is in you for you. He's your counselor, comfort, all these different things. But he comes on you to then be a witness to other people. And that's, like, th this construct of, like, God has set it up that we would not do power on our own strength. That we would actually rely and be equipped by the Holy Spirit. And, like, this is what I've experienced in life, and I've seen it so many different times, and I see it evident in Scripture that it's just like, all right, like, the Holy Spirit is alive and active, and He is willing to equip us and train us and teach us and lead us into to ministry. But I think this is a helpful context. Not to say that, like, if you don't if you have the baptism of the Spirit, you can't do ministry. And you're like, no, it's not true. Like, if you know Jesus, like, you have a testimony. You can share Christ. Like, it's powerful. Like, Jesus is powerful. But, like, there's this thing that, like, the Bible teaches about that is, like, an equipment and an empowerment where the Holy Spirit comes on you for ministry. And so I just wanted to, to share that to you. Um, so I think to close, Don, if you want to come up and I'll just kind of have like, a, I just want to really have just a simple, intimate, like kind of come to Jesus time in, in, in this and that just invite the Holy Spirit to come and have his way and just have, just really speak into the hearts and the minds and just as, as kind of to wrap things up. Um, but I, f I got this word for grace when I was preparing for this, that, like, this will be a place of, like, streams of living water. And that, like, this will be a place of refreshment, that people will come, and they will come to know God as this refreshing being. They will come to actually taste and see that the Lord is good. And so, like, and I just kind of wanted to close with that, of, like, I know that, like, Grace Church is going to be that. And it, it already is in a lot of ways, but just, like, even share that and declare that over you guys. And so that's the, the narrative that I wanted to share today, and that's kind of what was on my heart. And so I just wanted to go into this, this quick moment and just sit with the Lord for a few seconds and just invite the Holy Spirit to come and just really just mark your life, really, really call it, bring freedom where there is a need for freedom, bring restoration where there needs to be restoration, bring healing 
where there needs to be healing, all of these areas, and just that like God would speak clearly to you in this time, that God would speak very like <laughs> just very intimately to you, that if you're going through something, that like God would even minister to you in that circumstance. And so if you'll just close your eyes and pray with me, I just want to invite the Lord to come. And so, Holy Spirit, we just thank you, God, that you are the King of Kings and that when you come, everything changes, God. And when you come into the room as, as King, everything changes, that there is nothing in this world that is more powerful than you. There is nothing in life that is greater than you. There is nothing in life that has more value than you. God, what a gift that we get to know you that we get to know the living God who, who breathed life into man, who chased us down and sent Jesus and desires to have relationship with us. God, I thank you that you don't look at us through a lens of condemnation, but you've actually set us free from condemnation. So God, we just engage with you right now. And, and I just feel like something that the Lord wants to do in this moment is he really wants to bring freedom like this testimony that was shared today, like those people that are struggling with anxiety and depression or fear in those areas that are just like oppressive and you can't, can't get through it, I can really feel like there's this breakthrough that God has. And so I just wanna pray over anyone going through that just right now, in Jesus' name, I just declare it is finished, that there is wholeness, there is wellness, that there is, where there is any work of the enemy, we just rebuke it and say, Jesus, come and have your way. Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Bring freedom, God, in that, in that place. Bring, bring, we just rebuke any demonic oppression in those areas. You have no strength. You have no hold. And Jesus, just come minister to even past hurts, past pains, God. God, you are the comforter. You are the, the great healer. You are the re redeemer of situations. Enter back into those places and bring freedom. Bring healing to places of wounding, God. Bring freedom and healing to places of hurt, God. That you were there. You saw the hurt. You saw the pain. You took a beating on the cross for our pain. You took the, the stripes on our back for our healing, God. You are bruised for our iniquities, God. King Jesus, you are the, the Alpha and the Omega. You are the all-sufficient one. You are the one who brings everything into order. And so God, we just come before you and we submit to you. We say, come and have your way, Holy Spirit. Come and have your way. Yeah, and I, something else I'm just feeling that, that God wants to do is that there is just even an understanding of, of God's love that he wants to just increase on everyone's life. That, that he wants to release a, a greater revelation, a greater experience of his love, and that you would really understand and trust him as, as father, as a, good, as a good father. And so Holy Spirit, just come right now in these moments, and I just, just, just ask you to, to wash over people with your love. God, come wash over people with your love, that they would just sense your nearness, that they would feel your presence, they would, they would, <laughs> Just even touch your hands in those places that they're like, God, I just, I just, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Like, I just, I, I'm just at my end. And God, would you just come minister to them? Come, come bring healing in those areas and, and help them to experience your love, even in an unbelief. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And God, I just ask for just a fresh, fresh outpouring of your spirit. Just a fresh feeling for, for everyone in the room that, Lord, they would just be touched so marked by you in these moments that, wow, like, there are so many people that don't know Jesus that I'm just overcome and gripped with this reality that I can't help but share it. God, would you touch people's hearts, minister to them, give them your heart for the lost. Fill them afresh, Lord. Fill them afresh. Fill them to overflow, God. Mark them with your Holy Spirit. Come baptize them with fire, God. Come overwhelm. Come have your way. Come have your way, Holy Spirit. It's all about you. It's all for you, God. It's all through you. Jesus, we, we love you. We, we just live our life out of adoration for you. We say that you are good. You are merciful. And that your love does endure forever, God. 
And that we just lay out, like, just lay everything down, God, and say that it's worth it. You're worth it, God. And that we just we just thank you, Jesus, for for the cross and for knowing you. And that now we get to live life as a living sacrifice. As a living sacrifice, God. Yeah, Jesus. So we just we love you, and we, we just thank you for your, that when you show up, everything can change in an instant, God. When you show up, everything is different, that you can change a circumstance in literally, like, like microseconds, like, even quicker than a microsecond. Like, God, you, you are the wonder-working God. You are the, the miracle-working God. And what we might try and strive for, you can do in an instant, God. So, God, we just thank you for, for your ways. We thank you for that. It's beyond our understanding and that we just get to have intimacy with you. And so I just pray that, that from today, people would be marked with intimacy with you, that they would know you in a deeper way, God, that they would experience you in a deeper way. And that it, it wouldn't just be words on a page or words said from my mouth, but they would be received and, and encouraged to just be a revelation and, and experience with God, that they would just seek you, God. So God, we just bless you. We just bless your name. And we just thank you for today. What a gift it is. And so we just <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Say that. It's all this in your name. Amen.